<laughs> really glad to be here to be out. Um, so today, what I, two things I hope that we accomplish today is one, I hope to dispel the myths about angel investors, number one. Uh, number two, um, I hope that you can get a better idea of how to effectively raise capital in your early stages and your seed rounds. So those are the two things I hope you, you get out of this. So that you, and primarily I'm gonna explain the market a bit. Um, this is not in your textbooks, this is real world. And what, I'm so disappointed in textbooks and things because they still talk about the ecosystem as if it was like this 20 years ago. And just like everything else has evolved quickly, the ecosystem has evolved quickly as well. So anyways, um, a little bit about my background. Um, I uh, founded Blue Tree Allied Angels in October 2003 here in Pittsburgh. We're an organized group of angel investors. I became an angel investor in 1999 when everybody got caught up in the craziness of the dot-com era and um, became chairman of the board of our national uh, trade support organization called the Angel Capital Association. Served six years with the Securities Exchange Commission as an advisor on capital formation for emerging and growth companies here in the United States. On Thursday, this past Thursday, I testified to the Senate Banking Committee on some issues around demo days and how it's hurting the way they have some regulations around um, how you file 506C and 506B under Reg D. So I testified on that, and I also testified on <coughs> a couple bills regarding accredited investor criteria. So anyways, um, we have close to 50 million under management. We started a small venture fund uh, three, four years ago as well, and that has about 10 million under management. And so today, like I said, we're gonna talk about dispelling myths, but also, there's a quiz at the end, okay? All right, as we know, venture capital, I know you know this already, they finance startup and emerging growth companies, long-term patient capital, once you invest, um, you're in it for a very long time, usually get equity financing, ownership of a company. It's high risk, high return, which is why you have to balance your portfolio and with about 18 to 36 companies and hopefully um, you get a 22 to 30% return on investment. Um, exit is usually through M&A or IPO. IPO is really sexy, but it's very rare and it has changed tremendously in the past five to eight years. Um, IPOs really happen only if you are particularly a close to a billion dollar company. If you're not a billion dollar company, um, exits usually occur through M&A. So the reason I go through this to remind you of the definition, it is also the definition of angel, angel investing. Everything here applies to angel investing. So we have two entities, Blue Tree Allied Angels. So we aggregate active accredited investors providing money and expertise. Notice we don't just invest money, we invest human capital to invest in startup companies. Investors self-select investments and create a portfolio mix. The Blue Tree Venture Fund, notice the difference here, passive versus active investors um, is what we aggregate to invest in early stage companies, and it's usually managed by a professional team. You don't really get to self-select your portfolio. So I point this out again to show you that essentially these two things are doing the same thing, but one with active investors and one with passive investors. So what part of the ecosystem do they play? This might be similar to what you've seen in your books, um, your um, textbooks and things like that. But you can see where there's some crossover here. You will see seed funds and venture funds sometimes investing simultaneously. We just invested, the angel group just invested with, um, with a seed fund and a venture fund. Um, we, about, the spinity was about a month ago, right? So anyways, so typically, you know, this is the stage of the company that they're developing in. And you pretty much, I think most of you probably know this. 
So the thing that is really shocking to most people is the impact on the economy. And this is the reason, another reason why I wanted to point this out to you is because a lot of times people think because um, venture capitalists have more money, they have a greater impact on the economy. But they don't. So from 1980, this came from the SBA Business Dynamics Statistics Briefing, basically shows that firms less than five years old account for the net new job growth in the United States. In other words, companies five or years old or less are funding job creation. Um, without it, if you, take, if you take it out of the mix, you end up with net job losses. That's the red. So when it comes to the importance of angel investors, incubators, seed investors, this hits home whenever we're talking to people about job creation. Jeffrey Soule did another research project at the uh, Center for Venture Research at the University of New Hampshire, basically demonstrating just focused on angels, that's all this is, that create an average of 4.16 jobs per deal. That's just at the very beginning. Um, when I was testifying on Thursday, I, talk about, I talked about when we invest maybe four or five people are, in, you know, are part of the team. You're looking for a new team. But when we exited, we exited recently Wombat Security. It's a CMU spin out. By the time they exited, they had about 170 employees. So that's real job creation. So who really is funding? Who's really funding? So these are numbers from 2017. Angels invested 27 billion in the US market, VC 69 billion. They invested in about 7,700 companies. Angels invested in over 71,000 deals. Notice where they play, seed, early stage, expansion. Seed, not so much. Early stage, not so much. Later stage, pretty much, that's where they focus. There's 900 of them and over 300,000 individuals doing angel investing in the United States. So the big deal here is the number of companies that angel capital will invest versus the number of companies that venture invest. And so one of the myths you hear is that angels don't invest in follow on around, follow on rounds. It's not true. They do invest and they do like to protect their pro rata share. This is another way of showing it. Um, this is earlier data, but essentially you can see the light blue. They do follow on. Now as later on, these rounds get bigger. They, angels don't have the capacity. So this is something that I would like to spend some time on with whenever I get a chance to speak to people who are looking at raising looking at raising capital, is the problem with the angel market is it's messy. It comes in all shapes and sizes. So in that pool of those investing early stage as individuals, you'll get friends and family, which sometimes can be dangerous because they don't understand what you're doing and they think they're gonna get paid next year, right? So that can be very, very dangerous to take on family. They can be unsophisticated. So they can have a lot of money, but that doesn't mean they understand business plans, business operations, or have the connections to help you. They can be very sophisticated, where they really do understand terms, term sheets, business plans, can provide connections for you. They can be guardian angels. So a lot, some of them can be like mentors. They invest in you and they'll help you the whole way through. They can be totally passive, here's my money, Call me in five years when you, when you get something. Super angels. Super angels are big time, um, big time investors. Have you, heard, have you ever heard of Chris Saka? Um, okay, Chris Saka is one of them. Um, the, the sharks, those are super angels, okay? They invest and they, they have the capacity to invest billions. Ron Conway, um, there's a bunch of names like that, Mark Cuban, all of them. Then finally, 
the thing that um, tends to act like a micro VC are angel groups. Um, and they aggregate their knowledge and their money to create a professional portfolio. And angel groups have grown. This is really kind of an outdated. There are now over 600 angel groups in the United States. There's a few hundred in Europe. There are several in China, Southeast Asia. I had the opportunity to speak in New Zealand at a Southeast Asia event. They came from Singapore, from Japan, all over Southeast Asia. The very, um, so this phenomenon of people aggregating their money and aggregating their knowledge is worldwide. So the power of aggregation, that is why we come together. That's the market driver for angels. First of all, I found myself in 99 investing, and I wasn't a super angel. All I had was maybe the capacity to put $20,000, $25,000 in a deal. And if I'm sitting across from you, and I say, I'm going to invest in your company, you have $25,000, and you're raising seven hundred fifty dollars to a million. And I said, can I have a board, can I have a seat on your board? You're going to look at me and say, give me half a million. <laughs> you're right, give me half a million, you can have a board, on, you know, a seat on the board. That's the thing. So that was one thing. So I found that, you know, I couldn't have a meaningful impact unless we had meaningful dollars. And that may not necessarily be the best match for your company, right? As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little sideways here on this. We did an investment, we invested in money, and one of our investors put the biggest amount in the round. Um, and he thought he should have the seat on the board. Um, now, I'm not going to give you names, but he inherited his money. He never ran a business. Um, uh, he had some connections he could be at. But then we had people who in the group that invested, but smaller amounts that had skill sets and real experiences that could really add value to his company. And uh, anyways, so he wanted to talk to me about this. And we sat down and I said, well, I said, um, here are all the people who are investing. Seven of you have the skill set that can really help this company. And one of you is Ben Roethlisberger. Now, you all can throw the ball, but Ben, so you're going to tell me we're going to bench Ben because you want to throw the ball. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a meeting of all the investors, and you're going to tell them why they're, we're benching Mark, who's the Ben Roethlisberger of the whole group, who can help this company be most successful because nobody knows how to throw the ball like Ben. So you tell them why we're doing that. Well, he backed off. And that's the point is, um, when we're investing, is we don't want to invest just our money. We're investing human capital. But we also want you to be successful, because if you're not, we're not. So making good matches for you as mentors, seats on the boards, I think are important. So back to what we were talking about. So meaningful amount of money. Um, the other thing is, I found I knew nothing about the technology. I could certainly analyze the finances. I came from the banking world. That's what I did. I analyzed financial statements all the time. But as far as evaluating the technology, I was useless. So I needed other people to help me to make good decisions. So again, we could aggregate our knowledge, aggregate our dollars, aggregate our industry contacts to help the company be successful and co do collective due diligence. And this is more, most important than anything else, is being able to do collective due diligence. So the other thing is, I'm trying to create a diversified portfolio. All the principles you apply to your public stock portfolio, you have to apply to your private stock portfolio. So, and this is the riskiest asset class. So as investors, we know that out of 18 companies, probably 10 of them are going to go belly up. And only about two to five will drive home big returns, 10x, 12x, 8x, 30x. And the rest are going to be moderate returns. So in order for me to do that as a regular angel investor, what this does is it allows me to aggregate my money with others, 
aggregate their knowledge, we can do great due diligence, and now I have the capacity to continue doing smaller dollars. You know all those follow-on rounds I showed you earlier? I, this gives me the capacity to do follow-on rounds um, with multiple companies, because I can do less dollars across several companies. The other thing is that we have greater investment clout. If I'm sitting across from you with your company, and we're talking, and I'm trying to get that seat on the board, and we're talking um, everything from valuation to preferential terms, things like that. Again, if I'm talking to you as a single angel investor with $25,000, I have no clout. But if I'm sitting across from you and I'm saying, not only are we bringing $600,000 to your company for your million dollar round, we're gonna introduce you to two other groups or one other seed fund or another VC, whatever, in our book of investors. Now I'm sitting across from you, am I adding value? So again, greater investment clout. And then of course, the mentoring and monitoring for a positive exit. So these are some of the Blue Tree companies. Um, you can go on our website and, and take a look at these. Our portfolio is 40% technology, 40% healthcare, and I say 20% other. That other is, tends to be things that we see a really strong team, and it might be a consumer product, but what we're investing in are teams. And if we have a really strong team, that's what it's gonna attract us to invest. So I told you there's gonna be a quiz. And so we're gonna play name that angel-funded company. And I'm gonna give you a quiz. Okay, I'm gonna give you little clues and see how quickly you can come up with that. So the first clue is in 2017, this company had over 100 billion in earnings. I know that's kind of a foggy clue, so we're gonna go with another one. It has over 300,000 employees. About 3,000 retail sites. Any clues yet? Nope. Nope. It's headquartered in Atlanta. Pardon? Home Depot, you're right. So it's founded by Art Blank and Bernie Marcus. And what I like to talk about these guys, oops, we're gonna go back. I thought I had a picture of them. There. I like this story because these guys were caught up in a private equity roll up. They worked for a hardware store company. And they had this idea. So at the time that the private equity came in, they were losing their jobs. So it's not unusual. Private equity firm will bring in their own people. Um, so these guys were losing their jobs. And they went to the private equity firm and said, hey, we've been working on this idea of this big box store for hardware and lumber. I mean, putting all that together. And um, they basically were told to get lost. And they tried to raise money in California. Nobody in California would talk to them. So I forget which one, but one of these guys had a friend in Atlanta, and he basically said, "Come to you bring this to Atlanta. We'll, we'll give you the two million, by the way, that you need. And so he got about a dozen investors of his friends. They gave him the two million, and it's history. The thing is, the, 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 the winner here is Atlanta. By the way, these guys funded the new Atlanta Zoo. By the way, I forget, it was around 58 million or something like that. Again, Atlanta has benefited greatly because of about a dozen angel investors. So a lot of times, I know we all think it's all tech companies, right? But a lot of other types of companies get their start from angel investors. So we got one more for you. This one's gonna be a lot harder. 200 locations in 31 countries. 59,000 employees, 14, this, um, and I can't, the reason I couldn't, this company split, so reason I couldn't go beyond 14, because this is when they existed as one company. This is where they were, about 22.5 billion in revenue. HP? Nope. Founded by Charles Martin Hall in 1886. It's headquartered here in Pittsburgh. Material science people? 
Alcoa. So Charles Martin Hall, it's a cool, another cool story. The reason I do this is I want people to know that angel investing has been around for hundreds of years. Even the Romans, you know, gave money for someone to start um, a little business. You know, they're, you know, so a very rich Roman would give money to someone and own half their company, right? You know, so this has been around for a long time, but I love this story. Uh, Charles Martin Hall worked in Medina, Ohio, and I, there's a college or university there, I can't remember, but anyways, he was, got this idea of smelting aluminum. And uh, obviously nobody in Ohio in 1886 wanted, in Medina wanted to give him money, but where do you go for money? If you think about East Coast, where would you go for money in 1886? No, keep going, somewhere else. Where there's more money than anywhere else? New York. So he went to New York. <clears throat> um, so he had this great idea. He's presenting this idea. He's out there raising money. He is talking to a lot of investors, and they're really interested. Um, remember, this is the height of Carnegie and Frick and all those guys, and uh, Industrial Revolution. So <clears throat> anyways, um, he finds that New Yorkers want too much of his company. I mean, really tough terms. And he's like, there's no way. Well, he finally had a connection, just like Home Depot, had a connection here in Pittsburgh. And it wasn't Carnegie, and it wasn't Frick. It wasn't the Heinz family. It wasn't any of those. They were two no-name investors. Had some money, had a business, and said, we'll fund you. $20,000 each. And actually, today's numbers would be about, what, 200000 maybe more each, maybe 300000 each. Today's, since 1886. That's how he started the company. So again, landed here in Pittsburgh, grew jobs, but in Pittsburgh benefited. So this idea of angel investors has been around for centuries. So that's the point I really wanted to make here. So what I thought we best use of my time today would be to answer your questions, because um, you're all here because you're probably thinking of starting a company, or you have started a company. Um, and um, so I'm opening it up to Q&A. Fire away. Um, angels are mostly mo motivated return on investment. You know, so there's, there's that. You know, we have to think about that all the time because we're risking large amounts of capital and we've got to figure out how we get that back. That's number one. But secondly, one um, res um, research shows that they like to do good in their neighborhood. There is, there's nothing like I, I was talking about earlier, driving by and see a company that you invested in, and at the time they had five employees and have grown to 150 to 200. There's a feel good factor. The third thing is, a lot of them are cashed out. They have no interest in starting another business again, but they are very interested in, in being mentors, advisors, being on boards, being helpful because they have experience and they can provide that. So those are the top three reasons they become angel investors. Yes? What, what signals does that send to an investor if a company has already taken on a fair amount of like, grant money um, to fund its activities or is considering still going out and getting grant money after a uh, venture or angel investment? Anytime you can get grant man money, investors love it. Okay. Yeah, because that's non-dilutive. So that's, right, less ownership. So um, number one, if you're getting it before angel money, you're signaling um, you have some, you know, some good science behind this, right? And so you're validating that. And so probably closer to proof, you know, proof in the pudding. Sure. So that's, that's really good. So, and while their angel investors are investing, if you have a chance to invest, if you have a chance to get grant money from anyone throughout the whole time you're growing your business, that's always a good thing. So, um, you mentioned that um, it's more is more difficult for a company to get to the IPO status because you have to get to that you know near billion dollar um, you know valuation. But for some of the companies that are growing and mergers and acquisitions happen, you know, because a large company like Microsoft is like, oh, I'll just pay out two hundred million and, and take it in. But is there? How does a company decide that, okay, well, we're done growing. I think we should just exit now with this merger and acquisition. And does the board, you know, or as angels, do you guys ever push towards that? Because it's a lot easier to just say, okay, well, yep. you know, let Jesus take the wheel. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
That's a really good question. So um, um, the only way angels get their return is if, you, if the company merges or is acquired. Okay, so that's pretty much how we get our returns on investment. So at the time we're investing in you, we were paying $2 a share, and hopefully by the time it exit, it's $50 a share or something like that. So mergers and, ex, ex, uh, mergers and acquisitions will be what we will help you build a company for. Um, so when we do our board training, we say there's three things that you have to be w wary of. Number one is never, never, never let the company run out of money. Why would that be important for you guys? There's no exit value, but more importantly, never, never, never. You said something. No? Well, yeah. I was going to say, if your company is out of money and you go under, then. You go under, but more, you know, also a lot of times people say, well, I'll just raise more money. You can't. When you run out of money, Nobody wants to talk to you. Or if they talk to you, by the way, your valuation just became lower because you're in trouble. So number one, we say never, never, never run out of money. Number two, nothing is more important than the team. And help your CEO understand nothing is more important than your team. And that means help them make quick decisions to fire when they need to help them make decisions about their highest and best use. They think they can do it all. You can't do it all. And number three, get the company to a profitable exit. Those are their three primary things that they need to focus on while they're serving as a board rep. So M&A is the answer. Um, IPOs are just out of the question unless you're going to be a unicorn. That's it. Unless you, you have the potential. And the only way you can get to a unicorn is if you get hundreds of millions of dollars funding you. And that only happens in California and Boston. It doesn't happen here in Pittsburgh. So I think we have two companies that have received, but, and that's about it. I have a follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So during the time the company's uh, growing and they have, they have some revenue, um, this might be a naive question, but the angels would not get any, any profit sharing in that regard? We don't uh, want revenue. We want an exit. Okay. So, now, you bring up another point from that. So, a lot of times companies can be really good lifestyle companies. They can grow, they can be, you know, grow to 150 employees and never exit, right? So, when you do that, you're going to have to structure your investment terms differently, and you're going to have to look for different kind of investors. And that is, you want to look for revenue share investors. You, investors who will say, okay, I get it. I see you can grow fastly. I get your business model but we're going to do a revenue share model. And that means they're going to take top line, not bottom line, so top off of revenue. And you're still going to have to manage your company and grow it. So if you're going to be, if you're going to be a lifestyle company, there's nothing wrong with that. Lifestyle companies are really good companies, make good livings, provide livings for their family, you know, their children, their children's children, so they can do good things. Um, but the typical angel investor that I talked about today are going to look for equity investments. That's a typical. So revenue share investors are a lot harder to find, but they are out there. And there are revenue share funds out there. Um, I think Innovation Works just had um, a caffeinated, uh, yeah, so with all revenue, revenue funds, that's all they do. They just look for revenue share, right? Yes? That's a good question. That's a good question. That is a really good question. Um, so most everybody wants proof of concept, and they do like to see customer feedback and customer's interest. Although that's not a golden rule, it's most. Um, our healthcare companies that we invest in, they're not going to have customers, right? They've got FDA, clinical trials, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, so there's also such a thing as a hot company. You know, hot companies seem to get money quickly. Um, um, uh, Duolingo is one of those. I mean, it was a hot CEO, founded a couple companies, was easily could raise lots of money. 
um, and go on being unprofitable for a long time. Uber, Lyft, those are another example of being. But when we're on boards, again, we do board training. And what we do is we, we say at the, at the point we're saying the company is going to be out of money in nine months. And what you're going to do when your, your board's going to guide you on this, and you're going to look at your cash flow statements. Your cash flow statements are going to be the most important piece of financial documents that you can use. So what you want to do is your, you know, your worst case scenario, where we are right now, like, okay, our run rate with revenue, and where we hope to grow, and take a look at, at, at where you're going to be out of money in all three scenarios. But the scenario you're going to use is probably your worst case scenario. It's like, okay, we, we drop revenue for the, you know, we seem to be trending up, but we also had this down month. Um, will it stay? I'm not sure. Was this a trend or what? So you want to take a look at that. And at the point you're nine months, where you're showing nine months, you're out of money, start working on your strategy because it takes six months. So you want six, to raise money over six months and not be out of money. You want to continue to have at least three months or more because if they see you're at that point, I will guarantee you, you'll be negotiating a down round. So nine months is sort of like, and typically when I'm on a board, I'm looking at 12 months and I'm saying, I'm, <laughs> I'm not feeling real good about this. And here we are at nine months, you know, and we talked about this two months ago, and no more talking. We're doing. We're raising capital now. Mm -hmm. So you got to have that, because believe me, if you don't have that, you're in a tough position to negotiate your valuation. Is that different for a pre-revenue company that's talking about their first angel round? Like before I have a board, if I'm looking, you know, I have friends. Yeah, money you're, you're totally time. expected. When you're in the first round, you're totally expected not to. You know, people know you don't have money. You're here, you're here asking us for the first round. So we get that. So not to worry about that. But do have under, you know, it's really interesting to me. I hear people say, particularly Silicon Valley, um, I hear people say, don't worry about having a business plan. That you don't need a business plan. You can raise money without a business plan. Again, if you're Luis from Duolingo, who's really, you know, this is his, not his first rodeo. It's his third time. And, he has investors following him, but the average person who's raising money for the first time, you know, you better have a business plan. Because what you want to do is give confidence to the investors that you know your industry. And so if you don't, trust me, that plan will be so freaking fluid. It will change all the time because you'll be learning things that you did not know. And that's the name of the game. You're in a startup, there will be things you do not know. And that plan will be fluid. And investors understand that. So um, have a plan. Have a business plan. Know your customers. Know what the market's like and what they're charging. And you know, a lot of times people think it's most valuable to come in with the cheapest product and I can just undercut them. That not necessarily may not work. So if you know your industry, and those are the kind of questions you will get from investors. Remember, these are business people. They've built and sold companies. So they're going to ask you those tough questions. So know your industry really, really well. Normally, some of the exits for the angel money is like riskier investments in the beginning. Two-part question, how much do you expect equity to give up for an angel round before the series A? The rule of thumb for every round is 20%. So think about that. When you're building your pro, your pro forma cap tables, the rule of thumb is 20%. Every time you raise a new round, 20%. Even Particularly from professionally managed angel groups. If you're raising money, that's why a lot of people do, OK, I'm going to do friends and family and a couple, of my, a couple other people in a $300 to $500 convertible note round. That's really smart. Because once you get to professionally managed angel groups, remember, Professionally, angel group, professionally managed angel groups are like micro VCs. And they're interested in the rounds where you're going to put in $1 million to $3 million. That's where they're going to play. So that's like, it's called series seed. And that's where you're going to get, so 20% and so there. And what's going to happen, those pe people who from your convertible note are going to convert into that round, that's going to eat up some of that 20%, right? And then the next round, 20%. It's pretty much a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So typically, not necessarily. Here's why. 
Um, so in, in that round, you're raising, like I said, one to three. So you, when you're small, you want to be nimble. So you're either going to have a three-member board or a five-member board. And on that three-member board, there'll be like one investor, right? One founder and one independent. Or if you're doing a five-member board, it's going to be two investors, two founders, okay, re representing the common, and one independent. So again, I, I encourage you as founders is to make sure you have the right board member. I've had to remove board members because they were not the best board member for that company. And it's very painful. It's very tough. Everybody gets dysfunctional um, because they want to fight for their position. Um, and the CEO is saying, get him or her out of here. Um, it's a very tough situation. So what we've done now differently is we've basically said, talent is not the only thing that's important when we're making those matches. They better be a good chemistry match. Some personalities just don't click. We've all had those experiences. You don't want that on your board. So you got to be ca very careful. And people with money will demand seats on the board. But if they're not going to be value added, and if that chemistry's not there, if you're feeling something in your gut saying, oh, I know I need this money, but I shouldn't do this, don't do it. So when you're raising money, I tell people, get multiple options on the table. You know, don't take the first investor that comes along. You desperately need the money. Don't be desperate. Be confident. Be confident. Um, sorry, I have, a, I have a lot of questions. Um, but during the uh, due diligence um, phase, you know, you're, you're mentioning that sometimes this can take, you know, six, nine, um, nine months to a year. Are, are there certain red flags that, that come up more often than others uh, when you're looking at startups and there's something that would say, okay, well, we're completely not going to work with this company versus, okay, we don't like what you're doing, but maybe we can transition you to something else. Yeah. So, you know what, you bring up, a, so, you know what, I'm going to go back, so I want to talk about this. So, um, um, you bring up, a, so due diligence will take anywhere from, you know, depending on how much the, oops, you know, how much the group already has a familiarity with the science, how much research they have to do. So it could take, you know, two weeks, six weeks, six months. I've seen it take three months. Um, anyways, but you can expect that here all the time. But when you're here, 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 probably, um, they're not going to do much diligence. They're going to be the typical, as you, remount, as you would know them from your textbook, the angels that you just pitch to and they'll write you the check and when you go out the room, right? So, um, so know this when you're raising money from people, which ones are going to be the, you know, and this can be dangerous. I'm going to come back to your question, but this is in my mind. This can be dangerous. We looked at a really great company out of Cleveland that had an HR solution. And at the time, there was no one else, and this is several years ago, no one else on the market that we could find. They took in about 300000 from an unsophisticated investor at a $9 million pre-money valuation. And we basically, they're at now raising their sophisticated round. They're raising $1 to $3 million. And um, I don't remember. I think it was more like $1.5 million at the time. And we're telling them, here's a term sheet, you know, and we're saying, based on where you're at, at the stage of your company, you're more in the $3 million pre-money valuation range. Well, that sophisticated, that unsophisticated investor had a, had a veto right. That company could not fo get follow-on funding. They eventually went under because this unsophisticated investor kept vetoing things. So, yeah, it's nice to get someone to write the check anytime you feel like it, but make sure who you're getting in bed with and take a look at those rights they have. Now, back to your question. When we think about the first thing that we think about, the biggest risk that we have as investors is execution risk. So what we try to do, and the biggest red flag we have, is we have someone who's a CEO, but they can't build a team. Um, he or she has one of those personalities where they know it all, they have all the answers, and they're going to surround themselves with people that are yes people, 
right, rather than people who are going to challenge them and help them. So that's the number one, number one thing is, we all, so we say that founder is not coachable. And if there are signals that you're not coachable and that you're not going to surround yourself with people who can help you build, because believe me, you can't do it on your own, that's the first red flag. The second red flag is, remember, we're going to test your knowledge. We're going to be looking at things with you. We're going to be spending time with you. We're going to be sitting with you. And we're going to be asking, seeing how much do you really know about your industry? You know, so if we get a sense of, hey, I'm jumping into this. I you know, know nothing about this industry, but I just have a clue that this is going to be really cool. <laughs> That'll be the second thing. Um, a third thing is um, we like to see barriers to entry. You know, if we're going to put our money in, we know we're, we're, we're first in. We're taking the first risk. This is a long ride. We're going to be your partners for a while. Okay? How are you protecting this company against competitors? So those are the things we're probably going to be the first top three flags. Mm -hmm. I was curious about deal syndication and angel yeah. groups. So when you're raising, let's say, your seed uh, round, how do angel groups approach the syndication with micro VCs and other angels and who takes the lead and whether or not you're just joining? Is there a preference? Yep. Is it dependent on the angel group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of those factors. So first thing is um, we expect whoever's closest to the company should be the lead. lead. So I get deals from, I mean, we've invested in North Carolina, New York, Boston, California. But if I'm bringing a deal to someone, I better be the lead on it. Okay, so I'm here in Pittsburgh, so if I'm going to co-invest with my colleagues. But I also know what they like and what they don't like. You know, you, the VCs do the same thing. You first learn about who has an interest in IT or who has certain people won't even touch healthcare. You know, so we'll find people that. And the third thing is people we can trust. Um, we've, we've done things with people when we were first starting in uh, 2003. And... Um, you know, the, this whole idea that about the time there were only about 90 angel groups in the country. And uh, we chose to co bring in some people to co-invest with us, or we co-invested with them. And they um, ruined de deals. They actually ruined deals. Um, and I could tell you this story maybe another time if you want to hear it. <laughs> but um, it's people who we trust. Um, how patient are you? Yeah, how patient are we? You know, the average holding period is about five to six years uh, for tech companies and about 10 to 12 for healthcare. So we're no, we're, we know we're in it for a long haul. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, so are you in for no, normal insights? I missed the first 10 minutes, so you may have oh. gone over that, so I apologize if you did. For some angels, normally they are converting at the Series A if they do convertible notes, yeah. Convertible notes, you're converting, and then at that point, either the series A being the gorilla in the room is like either they want to buy, you know, you want to pay them out, and or they convert, right? Mm -hmm. Are you uh, is the micro VC fund like trying to <coughs> for the longer run, so it's not just seed, but seed and in seed. Yeah, and then, yeah, and that's the point I was trying to make is when you know this is a, you know about six hundred you know, angel groups, you know, that act like micro VCs in the United States. This is what we do. There are lots of unsophisticated people and sophisticated investors that will do your convertible note round, and that's what they're looking to. They're looking to convert. Now, about us, um, if we're in a deal of three years and a big VC comes in and wants to buy us out at, a, at the round that they've priced it at, we'd be crazy not to take it, you know, because what's going to happen is a lot of time when big VCs come in, that restarts the clock. They're looking for their five years, right? Now we're looking to hold it for eight. So for us, if we get that opportunity, those are rare. Um, we did get a couple opportunities where they bought part of our stock, and then the other half rode along. Um, so it's a twofer. We like that. We like it benefited us. So, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Most, 
Right. We're, we're, we're a micro VC. We do act like a VC fund, but an early stage VC. Mm -hmm. We're going to do the professional due diligence. As a matter of fact, our, we use the same thing that they use. You'll see our checklist is identical. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of founders have said, wow, you really got us ready for the, you know, the big guys that came in later. Because they went through our process, and they knew exactly what to expect, and they were ready. So, yes. So you said that um, at about 12 months or nine months out, you really want to be ready for the next round. Yeah. Um, and that you guys, are, for say healthcare, you're looking at 10 to 12 years out. How many years do you typically raise from an angel or for each round? I mean, you're looking at two or three years for the, for the company? Well, let me give you an example. So um, recently we invested about 1.8 million um, in, a, in a healthcare company. Um, we did um, a small follow-on round, and we're about to do another bigger round with them. So we're in the third round with that. Um, what we do at that point in time, by the time that next round is coming in, it's pricing it and the, the amount of dollars, we're just looking to protect our pro-rata share. So if our pro-rata share is like 400000 our whole idea, you know, because we invested 1.8, and by the time the, they're needing $30 million, you know, our pro-rata share is going to be a small amount, but we're still trying to protect our ownership. So... Healthcare is a really scary thing for us. We've, we're actually in a process of moving less into healthcare um, and focusing more on tech um, to get that to 50% and 30% balance um, because of that long tail. And it could, be, it could be 10 rounds by the time we're done. There's a company that we're, it's a spin out from the University of Pittsburgh. We've probably invested 10 times. You know, but it's doing well. <laughs> and they got something like 30 million of non-dilutive funding. So yeah, the rounds have been small. Yeah, 18 months to two years. We, we, 18 months minimum, you know. That allows you to get your feet wet, get it growing, and some time to think about, right, raising your next round. <laughs> so, yeah. So 18 months at a minimum. Depends on how quickly you can raise revenue. And how, and if you're a healthcare company, it's about what can we accomplish with this money, right, before we raise. And how can we um, get those inflection points so that we definitely, and when we're thinking about your next round, it's inflection points. Okay, so they're key to the industry because you want to drive your value up. So not just get lots of customers, but what does that, what do your inflection points mean? That's what we have for the question. So uh, does it sound like that every round you're doing, the, the first money is in the price round? You are, you are yep, but it's a price round, I know. This is what's interesting. You did miss, you missed quite a bit um, because Right there tells you, right here, 27 billion, 69 billion, 71,000 deals, 7,000, but look, seed, early stage expansion. So this is a US market. No, but this, I'm just asking, when you are, when you're investing and you are trying to, like, you're setting a cap or you're actually thinking about what If we are in, in a convertible note, we do set a cap. Yeah. Yep, so for in a convertible note. Some, like, those of us who are in this early stage where we're like, Two employees or three employees, and you're literally building your team. Right. What does the, the you should go. You should. Good? You should go to individual investors, friends, and family. If you're, if you're just, you know, I'm just trying to. I've got this great idea, and we have a. We're starting to build our business plan. You should go to individuals because sophisticated angel groups. They're not. They're going to wait for you to get a little further down the runway. Um, I think I showed it here. Give you some idea. Actually, I have next next time I should put that slide in. There's a, I have a slide that kind of shows you valuation points and where the money comes in. Uh, sorry, I don't have it this time. If you want it, Allison, I'll send a slide. Okay. Uh, could you talk about um, the proof between proof of concept and product development? What 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 the contrast between those those phases? Yeah. So here is. So let's say you got a desktop proof of concept. So it's it's not has hasn't been like manufactured by you know right now this is like a desktop thing. You haven't gone to a contract manufacturer. Um, you're tested it on the desk. At this point, you have your product design. You know you've got your first proto, first or second or third prototype. Okay, and now you're beyond that, and you've already got some customer discovery 
whether customers are going to buy it, whether or not they're going to buy it, or what they'd like to see. Saw a great article just um, this morning about um, what's it, when is when when is it enough? You know, when is it enough from your customers to be very different for them to buy it? What's what's enough for them to say, I will buy that, I will use that. Um, so that's pretty much the difference. This is like desktop. Okay, this is, we've done this several times. We've got this ready. We've got it ready to go. We can sell it to a customer today. Sort of like a little bit, <laughs> you know, this is like, this is a problem because this is not, so the, getting money is not black and white. It's so gray. So, I mean, it depends on what's going on in your company. So MVP might more like be here because at this point, is where you, you, you're getting a customer to say yes. So, so if you have, you know, letter of intent that you generated some revenue with an early product, even though it's not the final design of the product, it's, you know, it's early stage that, you know, because when you're a small team, you might not be able to incorporate all your features down the line, you'd be at that point. Yep, yep, that's pretty good, yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we doing for time? Yes. So, uh, If you go to our website, you'll see that we are further down the road. Um, again, we're angel groups into seed funding, so we're gonna we're gonna expect that. We're gonna we that's our preference. We'd like to see that. Now with healthcare, that's not gonna happen, you know. But we totally get that. We do like that because what we want to do is talk to your customers, and we want to get a sense of, you know, you'll continue to buy this. You're not buying this once, right? You're gonna buy it next time, next time, next time. Other questions? Anything I can help you with? You talk about how you go from, let's say you have an idea to the best impression. How do you introduce yourself to angel groups? What's the kind of process? Like? Ah, if you can get a warm invest, warm introduction, that's best. So through your accountant, your attorneys. Um, by the way, don't ever go into the market without your own attorney. Um, and um, and for us, and I mentioned this to Allison, I'm going to say it now, is that come to one of our screening meetings. And observe. We, we, we invite aspiring entrepreneurs to observe good pitches, bad pitches. And while you're there, you'll get to know some of the investors because we take breaks and you have a chance to network a little bit. Warm introductions are better because if someone picks up the phone and calls me, like um, you know, one of the attorneys in town says, you got to look at this company, I'm going to look at it more quickly. Otherwise, it gets into my, my pipeline, which we look at 600 a year. Um, and we only invest in four to six a year. So it's really important for you to get that warm introduction. And a lot of our investors are at competitions, innovation institute programs, on panels, you know, that kind of stuff. If you can get to know them and get to know, they come in in Alpha Lab and Alpha Lab Gear, they'll be there, you know, helping. If you get to know them, they will bring it to our attention, and that goes up to the top. Anything like that goes up to the top. Yeah, I was just going to ask a very related question around, like, how, how does an accelerator like Alpha Lab play into your thinking? Is that a really important validation point to have somebody go through a program like that, or not very important? Anything that goes through one of the accelerator incubator programs does get pushed up, mm -hmm. because um, we know that you're getting the support that you need to get started. So. Um, and so that does help a lot. Good question. Is it 1.30? Okay. Any last question before we go? Yes. What are your thoughts about corporate spin-outs if they're very early stage? Let's say there's an early R&D lab of a big corporation that's here at CMU. What are your thoughts on that, as long as there's no right of first refusal? Yeah, that's it. As long as there's no right of first refusal, we like them. That says, if they're interested, they see something and know something in the market that's needed, we like that. We've done that. And we've actually co-invested with a couple co corporate VCs. Yeah. Thanks. Allison, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, good luck with you. Good luck in everything. Good luck. <laughs>